to be together, always, with God's people. One of the great blessings that I've discovered in uh, the traveling that the Lord's enabled me to do is that if I can just find God's people, I'm at home. I may not know them, they may not know me, but uh, they'll welcome me as a family member, and I welcome them if they come our way, and that's a great, great blessing. Uh, I know about that introduction, uh, Brother E. Claude Gardner used to say, you know, uh, preachers don't need an introduction, they need a conclusion. So uh, I will try to get to the conclusion uh, sometime today. Uh, this study of the Holy Spirit is, uh, is a very, very important study, especially because of the way that it interacts with the Word of God. And in fact, I think what you're going to discover through the remainder of our time together is that the opening lesson and now this lesson will come into uh, all the other lessons. They'll tie in in various uh, ways. The Holy Spirit uh, is certainly uh, involved in the Word of God. In fact, Old Testament spokesmen were inspired by the Spirit. I did not try to write down every Old Testament reference that we could have used. I just wanted us to share together a few of those. For example, in Numbers chapter 24, verse 2, we find the case of Balaam. And I, I would like to know a whole lot more about Balaam uh, than what we know. He did speak by the power of God, and that's what we see here. And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And you know what happened. He delivered a message that the, the king Balak did not want to hear. That was not what he brought him there for. But nonetheless, the Spirit of God empowered him to speak. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 10, verse 10, we find King Saul. And here's what it says about him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And so again, Saul was inspired by the Spirit. Would it surprise you to know that the next king of Israel also was inspired by the Spirit? In the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 2, we find the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Similarly, in Psalm 51, when David is writing regarding his sin and begging God to forgive him of that, in verse 11, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Anybody that's read the Psalms, especially the, the opening number of Psalms, like, say, Psalm 22, knows the way that the Spirit used David to speak, as it were, from the spirit of the Messiah who would come. So the Holy Spirit inspired David to write in a way that was both consistent with the troubles that David went through and with the troubles that Jesus would go through when he came to the earth. Then we have Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 where the great messianic prophet, some 700 years before the life of Christ, says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Uh, significantly, Jesus was given the scroll of the book in the synagogue at Nazareth. And this is the passage, at least a part of it, that he read on that occasion. If you go on down, you're going to discover that he says, this day is this fulfilled in your hearing. And so Isaiah wrote the truth in his era of, regarding himself and how God used him but then beyond that, Isaiah wrote again out of the heart of the Messiah and delivered a message that would help us to appreciate who Jesus was and what he came to do. And then in the book of Ezekiel chapter 11, we find God speaking through Ezekiel. And I love the way he does that. If you've read that book, if you were to highlight uh, the key wording in the book of Ezekiel, one of those 
would certainly be son of man because he calls Ezekiel that all the time. And by the way, the other would be that they may know that I am the Lord. That is there over and over and over again. But in chapter 11 of Ezekiel, verse 1, we find, Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house. What did the Spirit say to him? Go down to verses 4 and 5, and we find a part of that. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come to your mind. So we have very clear evidence that the inspired spokesmen of the Old Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit to deliver the Word of God. But then we also want to observe that Jesus and Peter both said the prophets were inspired. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 36, we find Jesus making this statement. For David himself said, By the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. By the way, that is one of the passages that is used both by Peter on the day of Pentecost and also by the writer of Hebrews. In each case, they say, this is the spirit regarding words that have to do with Jesus. This is what he has to say. God was speaking through the prophet of old to about his son to come. Then in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, we find a, an interesting incident in the life of the apostles. You may remember, of course, that uh, by this time Judas is dead. He's gone out and hung himself. Peter comes along and he says, we've got to, fulfill, we've got to fill his place. There were 12 apostles. They've got to be 12 apostles. How does he come to that conclusion? Well, listen to him, beginning in verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language a caldama, and that means this is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. And thus it becomes a, a graveyard. And so that fulfills that passage. And then, and let another take his office. So on the basis of two quotations, the first from Psalm chapter 69, verse 25, and the second from Psalm 109, verse 8, Peter is arguing that the Holy Spirit has revealed that the office of Peter, or excuse me, of Judas must be fulfilled, or filled again. So they have 12 and not just 11. And then we have the writings of Peter. You've already heard a part of that. We're going to go back to it in a minute. But first look at the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Peter is writing to Christians scattered all over the world. He calls them uh, the, the diaspora. And what that means is that they've been scattered. You remember Acts chapter 8, verse 4? There's persecution of the church. And so what happens? Those that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Well, now Peter writes to the scattered. And as he writes to those scattered, particularly in verses 11 and 12 of this of this uh, opening chapter, excuse me, start at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, 
was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So we, the Old Testament prophets, did they deliver the will of God? No doubt about it. Did they understand what they said? And the answer to that is no, they did not. They didn't understand. They wanted to. They asked God about it. But God's response to them was, this is not for you. This is for a later time. And that's a very, very important thing. So we have the revelation to the prophets. And what is that? It's part of, remember, the Bible class? It's part of the mystery. It's part of that which is covered. It's not made known in that era, but it will be made known later. Now, turn to the passage you heard read just a few moments ago. And he read it very, very well, but I want to go back to it now. We're going to pick up at verse 19. Peter's writing again to the scattered Christians. And here's what he says in this second letter. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Could you pause just a moment? The word interpretation has a footnote beside it. And in the footnote, it says that that word could be translated origin. And that's a way better way to look at it because that's the meaning of it here. That is, the prophet didn't make it up as he went along. The prophet didn't write down his own thoughts without the aid of God, but instead, look at the next verse, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. An interesting way to display it. They did not make it up as they went along. Instead, they spoke as they were moved. The imagery here is a brilliant picture of, of what went on in inspiration in the Old Testament. We might say it this way. The Holy Spirit was the wind in their sails. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever gone sailing. I, for one, have never been. However, our son, for a time, uh, did like to sail. And he had to have a motor in the boat that he bought. Now, why? Do you need a motor in a sailboat? Well, if you've read any of the old, old novels <clears throat> about sailing ships that only sailed, had no motor, you may have read this word, they were becalmed. What does that mean? It means there was no wind. And so what happens to the sails when there's no wind? They just hang slack. And how are you going to move? Well, truth is, other than maybe the currents carrying you somewhere, you're not going to move. You're going to stay right there. The imagery here of these Old Testament prophets is that if it were not for the Holy Spirit being the wind in their sails, that they could not have written the will of God. It would be impossible. But because the Spirit was the wind in their sails, they were able to write. Now, brethren, when we think about this, let us realize that over the course of time, there were some 40 men who wrote the Bible. They wrote it over a period of approximately 1,600 years. And they came from all different walks of life. Think Moses. Moses was probably being trained to be the leader of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at the time. So he would have been very, very well educated. Think about Daniel. He was the wisest man in the kingdom of Babylon, uh, of course, because of God, but nonetheless, he was that. And then you've got men like John. John was a fisherman. By the way, if you ever study Greek, the first book that they like you to read in 
uh, in studying Greek is 1 John. Why? Uh, because John writes like a fisherman. He uses simple words. Why do you not start with Luke? Well, he was a physician. He used big words, and sometimes he used words that weren't common. For example, when he talked about the eye of the needle, he talked about a, a surgeon's needle. Well, who would know what that was, you know, in this era or that one for that matter? Who would know? So you've got all kinds of different men, but the Spirit took their vocabulary and he caused them to deliver the message that was true to the will of God. And that's what's significant to us. That's what is important. He was then the wind in their sails. So both Jesus and Peter said that the prophets were inspired. But then furthermore, the Holy Spirit is the promised comforter. Please look to the book of John. I'll we'll start at uh, John chapter 16. As we look at John chapter 16 in particular, <clears throat> we want to look first at verse 7. And here's what Jesus says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, please, I want to lay this groundwork right now so that we all understand it. When I went to Freed Hardeman, it was a college in those days. I, I don't know anything about highbrow universities. I was just a, a college guy is all I was. I drove uh, 1,545 miles from Mesa, Arizona to Henderson, Tennessee. And you might think, what has this got to do with the Holy Spirit? Well, just hold on just a minute. I'm going to get there. My dad had a rule, and here's what the rule was. When you stop for the night along the way, call me, collect. Notice I didn't say, call me on your cell phone. We didn't have cell phones. <laughs> and <clears throat> furthermore, uh, the only way I could call anybody was collect. I couldn't pay for it. And so, and so I would call him. How did he know when I arrived? He got a phone call. How are we going to know that Jesus gets to heaven when the Spirit comes? Isn't that what Jesus just said? Verse 7, notice it. Very careful. He says, if I don't go, he won't come. So how do we know Jesus is in heaven? Because the Spirit came. That's exactly what Jesus lets us know. Go down to verse 13 where he explains what the Spirit's going to do. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into, watch it, all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now back up to chapter 15 of John. And this time we want to look at, at uh, the closing verses, 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. <clears throat> and so the Comforter had a goal. His goal was to come and to guide them into all truth. Now, uh, look, if you would, to the book of Acts. We want to look at Acts chapter 1. As we look at chapter 1, you may remember that the apostles still are confused about the kingdom. They still think the kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom. It's what they'd heard all their lives. And so they're still clinging to that idea. But listen to Jesus, verses 7 and 8, when they ask about the kingdom. He says, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So what do we know? The Spirit is coming. When is he coming? He's the promised comforter. He's coming when Jesus ascends and is seated on the throne. So what do we conclude? Look at chapter 2 of the book of Acts, and we conclude that he is, he, first of all, chapter 1, 9 through 11, he ascended. 
We got that, right? Everybody remembers the men in white apparel, two of them standing. What do they say? They say, you're going to see him come back just like he came. How'd he go? In the clouds. How's he coming back? In the clouds. That's how he's going to come. Doesn't ever say he's coming to earth. All right, now look at chapter 2. And what do you discover in chapter 2? In verses 32 and 33, uh, the apostle Peter makes this point. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Did Jesus get to heaven? Everybody nod your head this way. How do you know? Because the Spirit came. That's exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. That's exactly what does happen. Now turn to the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we find the writer saying, Who, speaking in regard to Jesus, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now skip on down. Chapter 12, same book. He goes on to say, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You might say, why are you getting to sit down? Because the Spirit had to come. If he sat down, the Spirit came next. That was what Jesus told us. And so we realize the Holy Spirit is the promised comforter. And then the Spirit guided New Testament spokesmen. You remember in Acts chapter 2, beginning verse 1, we find a remarkable incident. It drew the attention of everybody who was in the city of Jerusalem on that day, as well it could. Listen to him beginning at verse 1 of chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit came, and they began to speak. What did they do with that? Well, first of all, Luke goes on to to say this. People rush to find out what happened. Do we do that? A few years ago, I held a gospel meeting, and I don't really remember whether it was south or north. I couldn't tell you. All I know is that going home, I had to go through Selmer, Tennessee. I remember. Now, Selmer is a little bitty town. In those days, it had exactly one red light. And I mean one Somebody told me it now has three. I'm amazed. But, but at any rate, it had one back then. So I was coming through that town, and, you know, when I got to Selma, it looked like Nashville at rush hour. I never saw so many vehicles in all my life in Selma, Tennessee. And I was behind a fellow in a pickup truck who had a woman sitting with him. I'm assuming his wife. And Farmer Joe said to his wife, what? Well, I don't know, but here's what he did. He pointed, and so I looked, and I could just about imagine what he said. Look, Ethel, there is some sheet sheet, uh, uh, metal hanging from that tree. And then he pointed over here. Look, Ethel, there's some insulation hanging from that tree. What's going on? Everybody for three counties had come to see the damage from the tornado the night before. And that's what he was pointing at. And I was looking every time he pointed because, you know, you couldn't do much else. We weren't going anywhere. I can tell you that. Well, why why am I pointing that out? Well, you you can see that here. We've got people come together. Why? Because of the noise. Like a great wind. We would say like a tornado. And everybody's wanting to know what's going on. Then they hear these men, and these are mostly ignorant men, fishermen, common men. But they're speaking in languages, in fact, 
Everybody in the audience hears in his native tongue. Those who, and I'm using modern day, those who spoke English hear English. Those who spoke Spanish hear Spanish. Those who spoke German hear German. And we keep going, but you get the idea. Whatever language they were born in, that's the language they heard. And so they began to ask each other, how are these fellows doing this? And finally, some sage in the audience said, they're drunk. Well, I can tell you, drunks have a language all their own. They do. But if you record it and play it back to them tomorrow, they're not going to know what they said either. So this is not the language of a drunk. These are real languages. These are real tongues. So what does Peter do? He stands up and he says, this is that. This is the fulfillment. Fulfillment of what, Peter? It's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And the closing of that is what? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Please underscore that in your mind. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, then he preaches and explains to them that they've crucified the very Son of God. And finally says, therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. And they're cut to the heart. They know what they've done. And now they ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? I think it's pretty clear to be saved. We've crucified the Son of God. What are we going to do to be saved? The answer is call on the name of the Lord. But Peter didn't say that, not in those words. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice, in the name of, under the authority of, call on the name of the Lord. Where do you do it? In penitent baptism. That's where you do it. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. So we see then that the spirit-guided spokesman spoke in the New Testament. Look at the book of 1 Corinthians in the Apostle Paul uh, speaks there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and here's what he says regarding himself. He says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, I know if you're following the outline, you say, you skipped something, didn't you? And I'll say, yes, I'm human. I do that every now and then. So back up and realize the Spirit also sent men to preach. So take, for example, Philip. Philip is one he was sent to preach. And you can see that, Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. And then what about Peter? In Acts 11, verse 12, he said, then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. So were New Testament spokesmen inspired? And the answer to that is an obvious yes. They were inspired, but of all the passages that I could cite, the one that intrigues me the most is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Listen to what Peter wrote to the dispersed Christians. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also, watch it, the rest of the scriptures. <clears throat> now, why does this intrigue me? I wonder what Peter's talking about. Which book was it that he found hard to understand? My best guess is Romans. <laughs> that's my best guess. I may be wrong, but that's what it looks like. But the key point here is Peter considered the writings of Paul to be inspired, to be delivered by the Spirit. So what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Word? The answer is Old Testament spokesmen were inspired. 
Both Jesus and Peter said Old Testament spokesmen were inspired. The Holy Spirit is the promised comforter, and therefore the Spirit guided New Testament spokesmen to deliver God's word. What did they deliver? We've already seen it. They told us how to be saved. If you today wish to find salvation, the Spirit would say, 